interpretation. We have simultaneous interpretation in French and Spanish, and you will find the icons on your screen. So without any further ado, Sylvia, over to you. Thank you, Claire. I am Silvia Fernandez de Gourmendi. I come from Argentina. I am now the chair of GAMAC. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth global meeting of the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes, GAMAC. While this is the first time online edition of a GAMAC global meeting, I am very pleased that it takes place since its postponement last year. Recording in progress. GAMA Global Meetings bring the community together to reflect and bring concrete recommendations on atrocity prevention. The focus of GAMA 4, strengthening national efforts to address hate speech, discrimination and prevent incitement, is very topical as hate speech is an issue of growing concern. All continents are witnessing an increase in xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, persecution of Christians, and other forms of discrimination against people because of their identity or belonging to a certain group, including women, refugees, and migrants. This increase in various forms of discrimination and intolerance is reflected in the multiplication of hostile messages disseminated through the internet, social networks, and other online and conventional media. Indeed, as recently stated by Secretary General Guterres during UNESCO Ministerial Conference addressing hate speech through education, held on 26 October 2021, Social media provides a global megaphone for hate. However, let us remember that hate speech is not an invention of the new technologies. Hate speech transmitted through both unconventional and conventional forms of communication, including radio and print media, has served to transmit hostility and generate violence including mass crimes in the last 75 years. Hate speech has been a precursor of violence, from the Holocaust to Rwanda, Bosnia, Cambodia, or the current crisis against the Rohingya in Myanmar. The gravity of these events challenges us and reminds us of the urgency and importance of responding appropriately to the problem as a precursor of atrocity crimes. It is my hope that this fourth global meeting will reinforce GAMAC's aim to contributing to move from a culture of reaction to a culture of prevention. A year into my chairing GAMAC, I really look forward to seeing GAMAC's community in action, united and together against hate speech, discrimination, and incitement. It is now my pleasure to officially open the online edition of our fourth global meeting of GAMAC, and I would gladly do this with the animated video that will now follow. Mass atrocities do not happen from one day to the next. They can and must be prevented on a permanent basis through responsive, efficient national mechanisms. GAMAC is a global and inclusive network composed of states, civil society and academic institutions brought together by the belief that atrocity prevention is a permanent endeavor and that hatred and intolerance must be tackled from their earliest signs. Hate speech, discrimination, and incitement are among these warning signals. But how to help each state with its unique history and culture to identify these signs? How can GAMAC ensure its global community supports national prevention efforts in all their diversity? Five years ago, over 25 African stakeholders answered these questions by starting GAMAC's first regional initiative, translating GAMAC's vision into culturally relevant concrete action 
the Africa Working Group developed a manual and a training toolkit on the management of national prevention mechanisms. Sharing best practices from the region, it carried out empirical research on hate speech in Cameroon, Nigeria, and South Sudan. No country is immune from genocide, and prevention is certainly better than cure. And uh, my vision is to build and grow a Pan-African organization, a Pan-African working group, that is robust and has robust national mechanisms in each part of, the, of Africa. Following in the Africa Working Group's footsteps, other regions have committed to bringing GAMAC's vision to their part of the world. The Asia-Pacific Study Group works on hate speech prevention and has compiled successful regional initiatives to promote tolerance and respect of diversity. The Americas Working Group, recognizing that women have been disproportionately affected by mass crimes, researches prevention in its region through a gender lens. A fourth initiative is now embodied in Europe. These alliances are vital links between GAMAC's global scope and realities on the ground. Through local expertise, they ensure states can efficiently identify and combat early signs of hatred so that atrocities can be avoided. At a time when hatred is on the rise and solidarity is too often lacking, it is encouraging to see your dedication to prevention. Let us step up to protect the vulnerable, let us speak out against intolerance and hate, and let us stand up for human rights, our shared values, and our common humanity. Join our conversation on strengthening national efforts to address hate speech and discrimination and prevent incitement. Welcome to GAMAC 4. And now, as part of our efforts to encourage each of you to remain engaged, we will feature inspirational messages from members of the community. It is now my pleasure to introduce the first message from the Foreign Minister of Argentina, Santiago Cafiero. Como país que actualmente ejerce la presidencia de la GAMAC, le damos la bienvenida a esta cuarta conferencia, destinada a fortalecer los esfuerzos nacionales para combatir el discurso de odio, la discriminación y prevenir la incitación. Los discursos de odio socavan la cohesión social, comprometen la vigencia de los derechos humanos y también pueden sentar las bases de la deshumanización, la estigmatización y la violencia en nuestras sociedades. Resulta difícil subestimar el rol que en la historia reciente han tenido las manifestaciones verbales de intolerancia, racismo, discriminación y xenofobia. En la Comisión de Delitos Atroces, incluido el genocidio. Frente a ello, existe una responsabilidad colectiva de movilizarnos contra los discursos de odio y en defensa de los derechos humanos y el Estado de Derecho. Más aún cuando las nuevas tecnologías y plataformas que nos conectan con el mundo también aumentan nuestra vulnerabilidad. Hoy más que nunca necesitamos de la cooperación y de acciones concertadas para hacer frente a estos nuevos desafíos. Les deseo jornadas productivas, de reflexión profunda y creativas y también que consigamos resultados concretos. As the Foreign Minister of Argentina says, we have a collective responsibility to address hate speech in this era of growing intolerance, the subject of our first panel discussion. After that panel, we'll take a 15-minute break before the chair of GAMAC moderates a discussion on hate speech as a precursor to genocide and other mass atrocity crimes. But that is not the end of the day. We'd like to invite you to take a stroll through Innovation Square. You can find out what is happening by clicking on the logo under the workshop icon. As I said before, we're really interested in hearing your thoughts, so do tweet using hashtag PreventionPaysOff and the Twitter handle at GAMAC underscore org. And of course, use the chat for comments and do share best practices. If you're having trouble with finding a session or need any other help, use the chat support in the little yellow icon at the bottom right of your screen. 
We're living in an era of intolerance where hate speech is on the rise. In our panel, we're going to be looking at the drivers of hate speech and how we address it while respecting freedom of expression. We have some of the most respected voices on the issue. So let me introduce Professor David Kay, Professor of Law at the University of California and former Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Freedom of Opinion and Expression. Teresa Ribeiro, the OSCE representative on the freedom of the media. And Dr. Taufik Jalassi, Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Communication and Information. So welcome, thank you very, very much for joining us. David, in particular, thank you for getting up so early because nobody wants to know how early it is in California at the moment. Uh, David, let's kick off with you and perhaps you can just tell us, you know, is there a definition of uh, hate speech that's globally accepted or globally applied worldwide? Uh, good morning from California, Claire, and thank you for that question. It's it's really wonderful to be on such a distinguished panel, uh, particularly for an organization chaired by my friend Sylvia Fernandez. Um, the, the question is extremely important. Uh, hate speech as a term, simply those two words put together, hate speech, does not have a well-accepted definition internationally. It is not a term of art in international law. Um, instead, international human rights law, in particular, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, on the one hand, guarantees everyone freedom of expression. That is the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media. But at the same time, it allows for restrictions. And in particular, Article 20 of the, uh, of the Covenant requires states' parties to prohibit national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to violence, hostility, or discrimination. And that is essentially where I think the common understanding of what we might discuss here as hate speech uh, might be. And that means that hate speech, as a matter of international law, really focuses in on the question of when does advocacy of hatred constitute incitement. So we tend to look toward incitement. And there's been a number of expert studies and um, resolutions adopted by organizations and law uh, concluded by organizations and courts, such as the European Court of Human Rights, that further refine how we understand hate speech. But essentially, when we think about hate speech as a matter of human rights law, as a matter of obligations of states, we're thinking about incitement. Thanks, um, David. Now, of course, those international uh, conventions, their uh, UN conventions, let me bring in Taufik into the discussion because I know that the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, um, feels obviously very strongly about uh, hate speech. We heard uh, Sylvia quote him in her earlier remarks. So tell us very briefly about what the UN is doing on hate speech. Thank you, Claire. If I may add to what uh, Professor Kay has said and agree with him, there is no commonly accepted, agreed upon definition of hate speech. But I would like maybe to suggest the UN working definition, uh, which says, and quote here, it is any kind of communication in speech, writing, or behavior that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group on the basis who they are based on their religion, ethnicity, nationality, race, color, descent, gender, or any other identity factor. So uh, uh, being at UNESCO, we are obviously a specialized UN agency. I want to contribute with this UN working definition on hate speech. Thank you, uh, Taufik. So we got a working uh, definition. Um, as David was said, there's, there's no sort of globally agreed definition. Uh, Teresa, is that a problem that there is no uh, total agreement on what hate speech is? And I hope that we're 
going to be hearing from Teresa. Teresa, do you hear us? I think you might need oh, to unmute yourself. You. I'm now, I, I think you can, you can hear me now. First of all, uh, thank you very much for having me today in this uh, wonderful panel. I want to greet my colleagues uh, in the panel. It's really, really a pleasure to discuss uh, today with you um, this very, very topical uh, issue for the reasons that uh, were uh, extensively explained by the former uh, the former speakers. Um, you know, my colleague said, "Okay, we have a working uh, we have a working definition." This was uh, what uh, what Dr. Tafik uh, said. Uh, Professor David Kay he pointed out uh, that uh, we need to find the right balance, and I think that's that's the problem to find the right balance uh, between freedom of expression and hate speech. Unfortunately, we see in many occasions uh, an abuse of the law, which means that uh, um, very quickly uh, we jump uh, and call hate speech everything that is protected by freedom of expression. And freedom of expression can uh, and, and should protect uh, um, uh, even speeches that, uh, that are uh, offensive, that can shock, that can disturb, and they are protected by freedom of expression. Hate speech uh, is uh, something that is different and was uh, very well explained by both uh, of my colleagues in this panel. If it raises a problem, um, I think the problem is not so much the working definition, which is, of course, very important for the courts, um, but it's also the implementation of the laws. Uh, you know, the, and, and the independence of the judiciary plays a role and a very important role. And at the same time, as we are uh, more and more in a globalized and interconnected world, um, we can, because there is not an agreed upon definition um, that is only one, that is uh, uh, not a multi-faced, not a multi-dimensional, of course, it can provoke some clashes between national legislations. Um, but at the same time, this is the reason why it's so important uh, to have multilateral cooperation in this particular issue, uh, especially now in this global world and the interconnected world uh, where we live, uh, uh, we are all connected by social media with a global reach. Mm. Thank um, you, Claire. David, um, as Theresa says, it's all about um, addressing hate speech while respecting freedom of um, expression. Um, how do we do that? Well, that's, that's an excellent question. And, um, and I think one of the things that Ms. Ribeiro really highlighted that's, that's quite important is that these issues come up in different forums. And so I think it's useful for us, and in particular, uh, Dr. Jalassi's uh, reference to the uh, working definition may be helpful here as well. It's useful for us to distinguish what we might think of as the state's restriction on expression the state's effort to, for example, um, limit hate speech, if we're using that term in a, in a general sense, versus other platform, other um, authorities, you know, such as a social media platform's uh, efforts to restrict expression. And if we think about it in those ways, then we can think that, well, if we're talking about a state's restriction of hate speech, the bar is fairly high for the state to actually criminalize speech. And that's because of the robust nature of the freedom of expression, but also it's a recognition that there might be uh, opportunities, there might be situations where it actually is important to address hate speech. That is the kind of speech that is hateful, that constitutes incitement. But we might look to different standards standards that are still drawn from human rights law that recognize freedom of expression but address hate speech on social media platforms for example and there the working definition might be particularly helpful but we can look to different standards 
uh, in different uh, circumstances and different environments. Mm -hmm. Uh, David, uh, both you and Teresa have mentioned uh, social media. I mean, perhaps, uh, Teresa, let me just ask you now, uh, the title of this panel is um, Addressing Hate Speech in This Era of Intolerance. So, you know, why is there so much hate speech now? Is it driven by social media? Is that the main issue, Teresa, that you see? No, I don't think, uh, and we need, we need to look at social media as important. I would say they fuel, they amplify, and they accelerate hate speech, but they are not the creators of a hate speech. Uh, the, 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 the hate speech is unfortunately much more rooted in our societies. There are other important factors. For example, uh, the irresponsible, um, the responsible speech of some politicians that, uh, for example, uh, South Division uh, have, uh, have uh, uh, that have a strong power of shaping uh, the public debate uh, and, of course, have uh, the use uh, hate speech as a strategy to, um, to in a way, um, you know, attract more followers. So we have quite a lot uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of drivers uh, uh, of hate speech and social media plays a role in amplifying it, in accelerating it, but I wouldn't say that they are the main drivers. Again, there is another problem which is uh, the business model of the platforms. The business model of the platform is really a problem um, because it, it really bets on the continuous engagement of the users, of the consumers. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that the consumer is more engaged, unfortunately, when there is uh, this kind of, uh, of speech circulating in the social media. So uh, there are many, many causes, um, and, and of course, social media also play a role and an important one. Mm. But don't forget the others. Don't forget the divisions that are explored by the politicians uh, and by the public officials, which I think uh, is, uh, is, is, are also very important, as well as religious leaders too. It's not only politicians, but also uh, religious leaders in certain parts of the world. Mm. Yeah, Teresa, I mean, point taken that it's important not to demonize social media. Uh, they might be the amplifiers or the exacerbators, but not necessarily the uh, creators. Taufik, um, I know UNESCO has been doing some work on monitoring uh, hate speech on social media. What, what can you tell us about the stage that you're at in that particular project? Well, yes, uh, we have been monitoring this phenomenon and actually uh, later this week we'll be launching uh, our World Trends Report uh, on freedom of expression and media development. I understand the point that uh, Teresa was making about the business model that uh, underpins, obviously, these internet companies. Uh, however, some of the actions that we at UNESCO we have uh, undertaken is uh, campaigns on media and information literacy. We have also engaged in a training of judges to respect uh, standards on freedom of expression. So far we have more than, we had more than 23,000 uh, judiciary actors trained on regional or international standards on freedom of expression. But also we have been working sometimes with the internet companies themselves on issues of uh, transparency and accountability as well. So we believe that we have to take these actions on two fronts. One is the supply of information, 
and one is obviously the demand of information. Media and information literacy is for the receivers, for the users of this information to make them more aware and to make them more uh, critical thinkers before they click on an information with a focus on what is misinformation, disinformation, and what is ac actually truth-based information. But on the supply side, on issues of transparency, accountability, and privacy, and we are doing that with the internet uh, platform companies. So, as you rightly say, there's the uh, there's the supply and demand. Uh, let's just keep on supply at the moment, uh, David. Something interesting that uh, Teresa was saying, and also Taufik was, you know, it's not in their business model uh, to stop hate speech. You know, this is good for business because there's more 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 clicks on this. And um, what do you think social media's uh, companies uh, should be responsible uh, for? And, and can you tell us what they're doing at the moment? Right. I mean, I think that that's, that's certainly been true in the past, that the business model of, of social media has been to attract, uh, to attract uh, eyeballs, to attract people to actually be on the platform. And the more spectacular the content, you know, people, the more people will share it. Um, we, of course, know that the platforms have also been abused, subject to manipulation by bad actors, whether they're governments or non-governmental actors. So, so there's a lot of room, unfortunately, for abuse of the platforms. I think over time, given the public's very significant concern with what many people think of as a, a kind of cesspool of bad content, um, the platforms have begun to, to understand that this isn't really in keeping with their business model. In other words, it's bad for business to have hate speech on the platform, and I think there's more understanding of that. I think right now, of course, all of the major platforms have uh, rules, whether they call them community standards or guidelines, uh, that uh, essentially say that hate speech, however they define it, is not permitted on their platform. The problem is that many of the platforms are so massive that dealing with the kind of content that we're talking about at scale is extremely difficult. And it's particularly difficult when we're talking about companies that may be based uh, in the state where I live, in California, or they may be based uh, elsewhere, and they don't have access to the kind of context, to the language uh, specialties that might be required when one's looking at a place like, for example, Ethiopia today, or Myanmar, or other places where there is very real hate speech that's problematic on the platform. And so there are real questions that we need to be asking. And then the final thing I would say on this is that, of course, governments do need to step in and require a measure of transparency from the companies uh, in, in all of this space. And I think the more transparency we have about what the, the platforms are doing, the better we will be able to understand what the response is, whether regulatory or corporate should be to those uh, to the problems that we're discussing here. Mm. I mean, David, do you think that they are quick enough in removing a hate speech when it's identified? I mean, again, this is a problem that uh, has different responses depending on the place that we're talking about. I think that if we're talking about hate speech in Europe or the United States um, or across North America, let's say. I think the response time is probably pretty decent. Um, but, but I do, do want to say two things. One, looking around the world, that may not be the case, in part because of the lack of language and context, context expertise. But the other problem is one thing that we should recognize is that the greater the pressure on the platforms to take down content quickly, the more likely that they're also going to be, feel a pressure to take down borderline content, content that may be hate speech but may not be, content that may be discussion or criticism of hate speech. The pressure to take down hate speech will also almost certainly lead to pressure to take down all sorts of content almost at the point that it's uploaded. And that should be something we should be thinking about 
critically as well, because as much as we want to deal with the problem of hate speech and incitement, we also want to make sure that government isn't really pressuring companies in such a way that they actually interfere with legitimate freedom of opinion and expression. Teresa, is that something that concerns you, that uh, they might actually be impinging on freedom of expression if they take down content which is borderline or which is not hate speech? And, and are you seeing those sort of initiatives in, in Europe and in OSCE member states? Uh, in Europe, and uh, you know the, the uh, you know the OSCE has a very wide membership. We are fifty seven participating states, so it, it means it's from uh, from Vancouver to Vladivostok. It's a, a, a wide and a very varied uh, region. Um, Yes, sometimes they do, but the problem is that that's the reason why it's so important really to look at the, plot, the, 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 the issue of the platforms uh, and to be uh, and, uh, and really to think about what is the best way. We need transparency, we need accountability, definitely, as David uh, just, uh, just mentioned. And at the same time, um, we need that uh, the platforms are fully aware they are uh, required to respect human rights. This is, uh, this is very key, because what is happening now in certain regions is that um, the platforms, uh, just to stay in some countries, um, they uh, they are, um, or should I say, they, um, they comply with the requirements of, uh, of the authorities uh, to remove some content that should not be removed. So we have, uh, we, we need to find uh, the, the, the right way to address the challenges of the platforms uh the transparency the accountability and uh, we need to take action in order to prevent that an authoritarian model of governance of the platforms will prevail because uh, of the pressure of some uh, member states some participating states or some member states uh, of the un or, or the of the or of uh, of the OSCE or the Council of Europe, whatever. But I think this is also very important. That's the reason why it's uh, this is a challenge we need to address. Mm -hmm. uh, we are living in a very very, uh, how should I say, grey situation. As David just mentioned, of course, because of social censorship, which is not good for the business. Uh, the platforms are doing a tremendous effort to solve some problems, to, in a way, uh, not give that, the idea that uh, uh, they just won't, they just don't care uh, about uh, human rights, about spreading uh, hate speech, and they are taking some measures that's true, but at the same time, uh, they are uh, also um they are also complying with some uh, some requirements uh, of uh, some uh, states uh, that want them to remove content that should not be removed mm. understood i mean taufik what is your view on uh, social media companies are they doing enough i know you've come up with 26 guiding principles uh, uh, for them. It is obviously uh, getting the, the balance right. W what is UNESCO's thought? Yeah, uh, if, if I may first follow up on what Ms. Reboro said, uh, I f we fully agree that we have to follow a human rights based approach to addressing this issue. Uh, that's what you have been advocating. Uh, and also would like here to mention that uh, we have, of course, the UN Secretary General uh, strategy and plan of action on hate speech. Uh, and we are in charge of implementing that along with other UN agencies. 
So this UN strategy and plan of action, very much dedicated to hate speech exists, and you are working on that. And I want here to mention a recent event that took place at UNESCO a few weeks ago, which is a global conference to address hate speech through education. So you may see this again from the demand side, but you believe that we have to make a major effort and incorporate uh, this issue in curricula, in teaching, and uh, to use education to this, uh, to this uh, end. Uh, Claire, you mentioned uh, what we have developed at UNESCO, the 26 high-level principles to enhance transparency of internet platform companies. And uh, this is obviously a process which focuses on content, but also uh, on the due diligence and the redress that is required through empowerment, commercial dimensions, personal data gathering and use, but also data access as well. So this came out of a multi-stakeholder consultations. And obviously, one thing that we try to leverage is that we have 193 member states and we try to use this multi-party, multi-actor, multi-stakeholder approach in coming up with principles and standards that we believe can serve uh, this cause. Thank you. Um, let me um, ask you, David. It's very, it was very topical at the beginning of the, the, the year when uh, Trump was deplatformed, a lovely new word in English, and uh, <laughs> it was the platforms that decided uh, to take him off uh, social media. Now, I know that uh, I think it was Angela Merkel wasn't at all happy about that, thinking that it was giving too much power to the uh, social media companies. Uh, wh where, where do you stand on deplatforming? Look, I think that it's important for us to recognize that the, that the platforms do create a certain kind of space for different kinds of actors to, um, to organize, to, uh, to manipulate, to build a sense of, um, of worthiness, let's say, of worth in hate speech. And Trump was an example of that. And, and I think it's also important to see that in terms of Trump's incitement to violence, which wasn't exactly hate speech necessarily, but an incitement to a kind of political violence that had you know, quite fascist undertones, to be honest, that the platforms decided that this was not the kind of content that they wanted to have uh, sort of coursing through their system. And that is, of course, also their right to make those decisions, right? The platforms are also as private actors able to make decisions as a matter of their freedom of expression, essentially, as to what is appropriate on the platforms. The question really is whether those kinds of platform decisions should be unbounded, you know, simply based on their business interests, or whether those decisions should be rooted in some understanding of international human rights law. And, and in fact, the Facebook Oversight Board, this board that, that Facebook actually created and, and appointed its members, um, did a, a, conducted a kind of public oversight of this decision and found that one of the things that the platform could have done and needs to do better is to be clear to individuals what are their standards, what is their enforcement going to look like when there's a breach of those standards, and be more transparent across the board when it comes to enforcing them. And so I think that as we, as we talk about deplatforming, one of the key things moving forward is going to be for us as a public to have greater insight into what the platforms are doing and from the platform perspective to ensure that not only their rules are rooted in human rights and their enforcement is rooted in human rights law and an understanding of the harms caused by hate speech, but also that there's public oversight uh, of that process, which we don't really have today. Thank you. Um, and I'd also like to encourage our audience to please uh, put questions in the Q&A to our speakers. Um, David, just coming back to something that Taufik said about uh, you know, this has to be done through a human rights uh, lens. Um, what does that mean? And are any of the social media companies doing it? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think that means adopting rules that are very clearly rooted in human rights law. You know, this I, this allows us. First off, let me let me say also that Dr. Jalasi's and, and UNESCO's overall approach to thinking about media literacy, um, to understanding of hate speech and media on the one hand, but also social media in particular, is extremely important both for the short and the long term. As, as the companies develop these kinds of rules, I think we have a very good basis in the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights, which say a number of things. On the one hand, they say to states, you need to protect human rights. You need to protect them according to your obligations under human rights law. But at the same time, they say companies need to adopt publicly, transparently, human rights policies. They need to conduct human rights due diligence, that is impact assessment, whenever they adopt a new, uh, a new product or enter a new market or decide to leave a market, what kind of due diligence are they doing in order to ensure that they're not um, interfering with, having an impact on human rights? To the contrary, what are they doing to prevent or mitigate that harm? And then the other issues of remedy and transparency flow into that as well. But all of those require policies by the companies. So we've been looking a lot at the uh, supply side of things. Um, in passing, everybody's been mentioning media literacy. Um, Teresa, what is OSC doing on media literacy? It is obviously really important that uh, the public can analyze uh, content. Yes, it is. And I think uh, we should look at media literacy under a double perspective, which is uh, to look at, uh, to enable the users not only to, to, to have the right skills to navigate in the very turbulent waters of, uh, of this, uh, this information flow, but at the same time to be responsible producers of content to this uh, uh, social media. So as consumers and as producers. And I think this is very, very important. So media literacy uh, should look um, in this double perspective uh, to the issue. Um, what we are doing, you know, we have now quite a lot of demands coming from the participating states uh, in order to be more active in regarding media literacy. Uh, and my intention is uh, uh, to start uh, looking at it and uh, looking at it as a cross-cutting issue. This is important for hate speech. This is important for disinformation. This is important for the platforms. So this is is becoming more and more present and should be more and more present uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our work at the OSC. Mm -hmm. And there is a demand from the participating states, definitely. I mean, Teresa, would you agree with Taufik that uh, it's um, a sort of whole of society uh, uh, approach? It's about media literacy, but also education? is something that's uh, needed? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I think that uh, uh, Taufik, but also David, they, uh, in a way, they, they were very clear regarding this, uh, uh, this whole of society approach because we need the private, the private sector, we need the states, we need the, the, the civil society organization, we need the media organizations, and we need the citizens uh, uh, as such. So we need all of them if we really want to tackle and to address the issue of uh, hate speech. Definitely we do um, in, is, in, its, uh, in its different dimensions. Yeah. I mean, David, isn't this, um, I mean, taking a whole of society approach, I mean, of course it sounds very logical and, and rational and uh, education and media literacy, but of course this takes time. And, um, you know, if uh, I've been the victim of hate speech, uh, I want it stopped now. Yeah. What would you say? Well, that, I mean, that, yes, that, I mean, of course that's true. I mean, of course these issues require both, you know, long-term 
efforts, you know, educational ones, policy ones. It requires, you know, let's be honest, it requires governments doing the right thing. And all too often governments themselves are, are the ones who are promoting uh, hate speech. But, you know, for the person who is the, the, either the object of or the, the subject of, the victim of uh, an attack on of hate speech, again, you know, we need to go back and ask, you know, where are we talking about? You know, are we talking about hate speech that has been um, uh, kind of a, a tool on social media? Is it the kind of speech that is designed simply, although this is deeply problematic, so I don't mean to minimize it, to push somebody off of a platform? In other words, is the hate speech a tool, <clears throat> excuse me, of silencing, you know, or is it um, a tool of creating physical harm, in which case the state must step in and, uh, and deal with that appropriately? And so there's, you know, there's going to be a different outcome depending on, you know, where this is taking place. But none of this can happen uh, on its own. You do need the long term and the short term happening at, at parallel levels. Mm. We've got a, um, a couple of uh, questions uh, coming in from uh, the uh, audience here. Um, let me ask... Um, Perhaps uh, David uh, and Theresa might also have a view. Um, the European Commission has a Digital Services Act on illegal content uh, at the moment. I think it's going through uh, the European Parliament uh, as it makes its way then to the Council of uh, Ministers. Um, and the uh, writer says some people see this as a censor's charter. Um, what's your take on uh, this uh, European Commission's Digital Services Act? Well, I'm happy to just say a, a brief word. I mean, the, the, the Digital Services Act, which is pending um, and is the subject of you know, very significant debate in the European system right now, um, you know, has at its core demands for transparency and accountability. And I think that's very important. And I think it's especially important that the that those who are debating and discussing the legislation itself right now really stick to some very basic fundamental principles. And it, it's of course the DSA is not um, merely about hate speech. It's about the the nature of the responsibility of uh, of platforms of the very largest platforms in particular. Uh, in an age where they have so much power over public speech. I'm very supportive of a process that leads to the implication, the, the imposition of fundamental standards, fundamental human rights, of uh, transparency in that process. And it seems to me that certainly the originally tabled version of the DSA does that. There are some more concerning things that are happening in the debate, but but I think that at, at the point of departure, the, the need for a DSA is important. It will certainly have implications for our understanding of and the transparency of how platforms deal with uh, problems such as hate speech. Um, Teresa, you're nodding, you're nodding your head. Any thoughts that you want to add to that question about the European Commission's Digital Services Act? No, just to, ju just to join what, uh, what David uh, just uh, just sad and uh, and really um, underlining the importance uh, of uh, of the discussions around it and the importance uh, uh, of uh, of having uh, a legal um, a legal tool and uh, uh, at least a, a legal um, approach. Uh, to the questions of uh, responsibility, transparency, accountability, uh, and also um, appeal um, appeal uh, procedure, because this is important. It's and again, uh, it's uh, the way to have remedies uh, to in the short term for the one that has been uh, in a way hurt by. Um, hate speech uh, in uh, in a platform, 
what can we offer to him? We cannot say, okay, in 20 years, media literacy um, uh, will, uh, will, will bring a, a good response to it. And so all these appeal mechanisms, it's also very important that they are there and that we, we say that they are quick, they can work really, and they can protect the ones that are victims of hate speech. Um, Taufik, um, a question here on whether you can provide examples of training and education programs on human rights protection and promotion. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with what uh, the two colleagues have said uh, so far. And what uh, Mr. Ribeiro said just now that, you know, MIL, media and information literacy takes some time, while maybe some people want immediate action and immediate impact. Uh, we have been working, back to your question, Claire, we, are, we have been working on a number of dimensions and programs, uh, certainly in the context of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We were engaged in a major project funded by the EU, actually, uh, very much to, to fight what you call the disinfodemic and the misinformation. Uh, because, of course, here it's misinformation about the COVID, but it goes all the way to hate speech and speech of uh, extremism, of violence uh, spread through digital platforms and online. Uh, one of the studies we did revealed that women journalists were in particular uh, let's say targeted. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned that uh, these actions start online, but then we see the impact of them offline. I think we have like a 20, 25 percentage of women journalists who are subject to this type of speech online or harassment were physically attacked subsequently. So here it is really, we are not de dealing with two different spaces, the physical space and the digital space. We see a continuum while while things do start online and then they follow up sometimes physically uh, we have been advocating a rome approach i mean part of what transcends across our actions the rome approach r o a m which means a human rights based open accessible and multi-stakeholder approach this has been guiding all of our work internet our principles for internet universality but also the use of these uh, digital platforms and emerging technologies uh, so we have done a number of projects in africa and elsewhere in latin america when i mentioned the judges initiative and the training on the standards of freedom of expression but all of these or a good part of these is guided by our rome framework and by our internet universality indicators um, there's, uh, there's another question here which uh, picks up on something that you were saying, uh, Taufik, and any and David and Teresa um, will have this as, I think, our, our final question that's come in, is, of course, a lot of this hate speech is directed at women, um, particularly women politicians. Um, in my own country, in the UK, we've, we've seen, uh, you know, the death of uh, Joe jo Cox. Um, so what can be done uh, you know, with this hate speech, which does seem to be very virulent against whether it's women journalists or women pol politicians. Whoever speaks first can answer the question. Teresa. Thank you, thank you. You know, uh, yes, it's very true what uh, Dr. Tofiki uh, just, uh, just mentioned, that there is nothing virtual uh, about uh, uh, about uh, online harassment of women journalists, nothing. And twen in twenty percent of the cases, uh, this online violence transforms in uh, uh, offline violence. So nothing virtual about it, and we need to take it very seriously. And um, uh, you know, we have we are working very 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 hard on this, uh, on the problem of online harassment of uh, women journalists, uh, because, because of the online harassment, there are quite, of a, of a, quite a lot of women um, uh, leaving the profession. They don't want to be targeted by uh, this constant uh, online uh, harassment. We know the cases, uh, uh, the cases of Maria Ressa, for example, of this constant online harassment, as well as uh, of the other British, uh, very well-known British uh, journalists. Uh, 
uh, and uh, the kind of uh, the kind of terrible experience they experienced, the, the, the terrible terrible experience they went uh, through. Uh, and we have a project. And what is interesting? This is a project uh, for quite a long time. Uh, we. Uh, we did uh, a lot of research, uh, then we identify uh, the, the right stakeholders uh, uh, with, which, uh, with, uh, with which we should address the issue in order to bring some solution to it. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, it's uh, more and more uh, well received across the whole region. Um, in Central Asia, as well as in Southeast Europe, uh, everywhere uh, what we see, which means that the problem is there and it uh, is, uh, uh, is being felt as someone that is a very, very serious problem. Um, that's the reason why the interest, the demand uh, is growing in the OSU region. Uh, and this uh, is uh, very, very interesting, uh, and we really need to work more on it. Uh, if we don't have uh, women journalists, if we lose them, uh, of course, this will be a terrible blow for pluralism and for, of course, for freedom of expression, but, but also for pluralism, for the diversity of voices in our society. So this is very serious, uh, and we really need to address this big, big uh, uh, challenge. With my eye on the clock, I understand that we have a Miro board and that people have been working behind the scenes and have been writing down some of the quotes uh, that our speakers have been uh, giving us. There we are. Um, it's now your opportunity, uh, David, Taufik and Teresa, uh, to see whether you've been correctly <laughs> quoted or, or not. But uh, I think uh, there we are. Uh, the ones in bold are most probably the easiest ones to uh, look at. Uh, David uh, K need to find the right balance, of course, between addressing hate speech and uh, respecting human rights. Uh, dealing with content at scale is difficult. Uh, Taufik about uh, the S got to deal with the supply of information and the demand of uh, information. And uh, Teresa with many, many ones, but because there's a light shining in my face at the moment, I can't read them out uh, for Teresa. Um, but let me then just ask each of our speakers for a last 30 second tweet that no doubt will appear on this board uh, afterwards. Uh, Taufik, what is your key takeaway for our audience? I think my, uh, my message here is clearly uh, my colleagues have stressed the complexity of the matter, the crucial importance of the matter. Uh, here to quote just one of the ambassadors at UNESCO, he told me this matter is a matter of national security for my country. I think that's not an exaggeration. Uh, and some of the examples that, that you mentioned, uh, my two colleagues uh, really attest to that. Uh, UNESCO sees its role as a facilitator of a process that requires multiple actors in a truly consensus-seeking, multi-stakeholder approach. We need to work together to tackle this issue that is vital to citizens, to our societies going forward. It's truly a global challenge for which we need to come together to find an effective response. Teresa, your final message. My final message uh, is very much uh, is very much convergent to what uh, uh, I heard from Dr. Tafiki, uh, and this: let's join forces, let's do it together. We cannot do it alone uh, in our in our small corners. We have to join forces. And David, final word to you. I think my takeaway would be that. Um, we're dealing with very important issues here, and it's absolutely essential that as as big a problem as hate speech is, and as a big a problem it is for the safety of people around the world and for the security of nations around the world, 
it's essential that our responses be guided by the rule of law, by human rights law in particular, and by requiring from those public authorities or private authorities that are aiming to restrict it, that they demonstrate the necessity of doing so, and that they do so with attention to the real harms uh, that may flow from uh, forms of hate speech. Thank you very much. And you can see that uh, those messages were appearing on that board as you were saying them. And I'd like to thank very much Dr. Taufik Jalassi, who's the Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Communication and Information, Professor David Kay, Professor of Law at the University of California, and Teresa Ribeiro, the OSC representative on freedom of the media for joining us. So thank you. thank you. And let me say that we're now going to take a 15 minute break. And when we come back, the chair of GAMAC is going to be moderating a panel on the precursor to genocide and other mass atrocity crimes. So please do join us for the next 15 minutes. You have a break. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back from the break and I hope you feel fully refreshed. So we are now going to have a panel which is moderated by the chair of GAMAC, which is going to be on uh, genocide as a precursor, uh, hate speech as a precursor to uh, genocide. Just a reminder to you that uh, interpretation is available in French and Spanish. You will find the icons on your screen. We're going to start this session, though, by hearing from the former UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Mr. Adama Dieng. Depuis le Sénégal, je vous salue. Aujourd'hui, notre monde est dans la tourmente et je me demande parfois si nous avons retenu les leçons de l'histoire. Il y a 27 ans, un million de personnes ont été exterminées au Rwanda en l'espace de 100 jours parce qu'elles étaient Tutsi, en génocide perpétré sous le regard passif de la communauté internationale. Et pourtant, tous les facteurs de risque de crimes contre l'humanité, du crime de génocide, étaient réunis. Avant les machettes, le discours de haine occupait déjà l'espace médiatique. Oui, les mots tuent autant que les balles. Aujourd'hui, nous assistons à la montée alarmante des discours de haine, de stigmatisation et de discrimination. C'est pourquoi nous devions investir davantage dans la prévention pour faciliter l'aube d'un monde sans atrocité criminelle. Nul doute que de vos analyses factuelles découleront des recommandations pratiques pour un changement de paradigme dans la façon de mener nos actions de prévention. Témoin des initiatives du groupe africain depuis Mani et Kampala, j'espère que leur détermination sera une source d'émulation pour les acteurs des autres régions. Je souhaite plein succès à Gamma 4. We are hearing from Adama Dieng, the former UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, reminding us that there's much more work to be done. Apologies if you weren't able to hear him in the live stream, but there were subtitles, so I'm sure that everybody got the seriousness of his message. So, with no further ado, I am now going to hand over to the moderator of our next panel, Silvia Fernandez de Gorendi. Silvia, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Claire, for for uh, for this uh, for giving these updates, uh, for introducing our second panel. We had a first one, a uh, very inspiring first panel where we understood, I think, a bit better what is hate speech and what can be done to counter hate speech or what should be done to counter hate speech in the long term, in the short term, and of course the difficulties of doing so. And uh, actually we also had a very interesting discussion in this panel on who should do it, states, social media companies, society as a whole, and, um, and of course, what to do when hate speech is directed to particularly vulnerable groups. Now, to, in this panel, we will continue this discussion and we will discuss hate speech as a risk indicator and triggering factor of mass atrocities. This, I hope, will provide an in-depth analysis on cases of hate speech as a precursor to genocide and other mass atrocity crimes. So let me first uh, uh, start by um, a warm welcoming to our distinguished panelists. Let me introduce them. We are here honored to have uh, among us Ms. Alice Nuderitu, United Nations Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, whose support and contribution to the works of GAMAC Steering Group are extremely important and invaluable to us. Then we have Mr. Vischer Ten Have, advisor of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, which is the oldest of GAMAC's informal alliances. And then there is Lieutenant General Romeo Daller, honorary chair of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, MIX, 
and um, I am pleased to know that Mix is also a GAMAC long-time partner. And uh, last but not least, we have Ms. Susan Benesch, founder of the Dangerous Speech, uh, Speech Project. So let's start with you, Alice, if I may. Alice, on June 18, 2019, the United, Na uh, United Nations Secretary General launched the UN Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech and provided a guidance note on addressing and countering COVID-19 related hate speech on 11 May 2020. Can you provide us with an update on its implementation at the UN level and more particularly at the national level? And, um, and of course, I would uh, uh, also ask you if you can also tell us how can GAMA com GAMAC's community contribute to the implementation efforts so national mechanisms are reinforced towards addressing and tackling hate speech, particularly during COVID-19. Alice, you are all ears. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Judge, as always. And from the outside, I really like to express my gratitude to the Excuse me, Alice, but uh, there is some problems with the sound. She has so to put up, she has to put up the sound. You need to put up your sound. Can you put up your sound on your end? They are telling me that it is on your end that you should be putting up. It's at 100%. Wow, my God. You are 100%. Yes. Maybe you can get closer to, to the microphone then. Yeah, they, I think we are. I think you are getting better there. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better, much better. Thank you very much, Alice, for this. Let's start again. <laughs> I'm right next to my computer. I'm talking right into it. <laughs> yes, I can see. Thank you. All right, then. So I was saying thank you very much, expressing gratitude uh, to Ghana and to the self judge um, for organizing the, this uh, fourth plenary meeting of the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes and uh, inviting me to this very good panel. In the, uh, mm. In other spaces. And um, you talked about the, the um, plan of action that was launched by the Secretary General, um, Antonio Guterres. And, uh, in um, on 18th June 2019, and since then, uh, what has happened? Um, what has happened is that um, the Secretary General launched the plan of, of action on, on his speech with my office as a focal point to implement the strategy in this plan of action, and um, we do this mainly by providing uh, support to UN field entities to develop context-specific plans of action on his. Speech. Um, I have a team that just came from Bosnia and Herzegovina. They've gone there to help the UN team there to develop a I am sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but we do have some problems. Uh, I think, well, the other panelists are muted, so I don't know where this is coming from, but we have a lot of background noise. Oh, I'm sorry, but it seems that not only you need to be close to your computer, but you cannot move anything. <laughs> I'm sorry for this, Alice. I'm very sorry. Sorry? Yeah, the, you, you need to be careful with not touching the microphone or moving too much, because then there is a lot of background from your end. Okay. But you were telling us about the plan of action of Guta, uh, Secretary General Guterres. Okay. Yes, I was saying that uh, we have a plan of action that mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned, and mm -hmm. I mentioned too. Mm -hmm. That was launched uh, in 18th June 2019, and mm -hmm. uh, we uh, office is the focal point for its implementation. And uh, in regard to its implementation, that um, we work with UN field entities um, to make sure to develop context-specific plans of action on, on his speech. And we know that um, right now there's a lot of consciousness around the world in terms of hateful narratives, um, how much that they are informing uh, violence. Uh, but this has been the state of the world for quite a bit of time. And uh, 
So what we are doing now is that um, we receive several requests from UN country teams around the world. And uh, I was talking about um, two members of my team who have uh, been just come back from Bosnia and Herzegovina, where they've helped the team there to develop a um, plan of action, a context specific plan of action. And before that, they were in Kenya. And th there have been quite a number of countries um, that now have uh, context specific plans of action for UN country teams. They include Cote d'Ivoire, they include Sri Lanka, they include Ethiopia, they um, include Ukraine, um, Costa Rica, quite a number of countries. So um, in this regard, we also have, uh, right now, we, we have um, supported a drafting of mandates. And now we have some peacekeeping and special political missions that are specifically mandated to monitor, analyze, and report on his future trends because of the growing rise of this phenomenon and really and the impact that uh, it's out there, partly due to the fact that uh, social media amplifies um, the, um, the hate speech. So, so my office has taken this leading role in further developing UN policy on hate speech. And uh, in September last year, we published uh, a specific detailed guidance to support the implementation of the UN strategy at the national level. And this detailed guidance is especially for UN field entities, but can also be used by everyone else in society take action to tackle his speech in a holistic way we are in the process of finalizing a guidance note on gender-based hate speech that was developed with the support of the working group on his speech and i believe that, that this will be especially helpful um not just to you and entities but to everyone out there to address his speech based on misogyny and discrimination along gender lines um in october um just uh, a few weeks ago on october um, 26th uh, we held in partnership with unesco a global education ministers conference on the role of education in addressing and addressing the of the speech. This conference was attended by ministers of education from the whole world. And um, we convened by the secretary general. And um, so the conference has resulted in an outcome document, which we are now implementing. It has very specific recommendations for countries, ministry of education in particular, on addressing his through education. And of course my office continues to work closely with UNESCO and on all this. Then my office also facilitated the development of the plan of action for religious leaders and actors to prevent incitement to violence that could lead to atrocity crimes. It's also called the phase plan of action. So this plan of action provides recommendations to religious actors on how to prevent incitement to violence and become agents of atrocity prevention. And then in addition to this, um, we have seen um, that phase speech has been placed in the agenda of many different intergovernmental forums of the United Nations. We've been putting that out and supporting that. And in July this year, um, we were very proud. Um, we supported um, the resolution under the sponsorship of uh, the government of Morocco, um, the, the adoption of the resolution by the General Assembly that called for member states to provide support to the implementation of the UN strategy on hate speech. This resolution has also established 18th June as the International Day for Countering His Speech. So, and it requests the President of the General Assembly to organize a high-level meeting on his speech to mark the commemoration of this first International Day. And um, I, I would request um, GAMAC um, to have this day in mind, because we will be reaching out to you to see what it is that we can do together on um, the International Day of His Speech. The new, the first one will be on the, the year 2022. And um, at the end of last month, again, October 28th, um, my office uh, responded to the invitation of the Security Council um, to co-organize uh, with uh, the president then, Kenya, an area formula meeting of the Security Council on addressing and countering his speech and preventing incitement to discrimination, hostility, and violence on social media. And uh, I briefed the Security Council. And um, I, with me, um, my office brought on board representatives from Facebook, Google, Twitter, TikTok, and Access Now, uh, which is a non-governmental organization. So given that social media platforms are likely to become a key factor in promoting uh, hate speech and facilitating incitement to discrimination, hostility, and violence in situations addressed by the Security Council, this meeting was essential to begin a dialogue between council members, the UN, and social media companies on the role of social media in conflict and post-conflict situations and on their contribution to international peace and security. It is my intention um, to brief the Security Council as many times as possible on different aspects of his speech. And right now, I've put out a request to the current president to provide uh, another brief 
on uh, hate speech uh, from the perspective of the funding of, of hate speech, who funds hate speech. So I would say that history has taught us that hate speech can be a precursor to and a trigger of genocide war crimes and crimes against humanity. And I was recently in Rwanda and Bosnia Herzegovina, two countries that played a key role in the formation of this office because those my office was created as a, as a result of the failure of uh, the international community and of the UN to stop the genocides in the Bosnia Herzegovina and Rwanda. So I would say that uh, in regards to hate speech, um, in the, for both countries, I was responding to growing concerns of online and offline hate speech, as well as to persistent patterns of denial of the crime of genocide and glorification of war criminals, which is often closely connected to the use of hate speech. In Bosnia Herzegovina, especially, I was appalled by the extent of existing hate speech along identity lines, visible in newspapers, visible in so many spaces. And it's all related to the denial of the Srebrenica genocide and the glorification of, of convicted war criminals. And so in the last few months, uh, the country has been paralyzed by a serious political crisis, which is marked by constant hate speech, divisive rhetoric, perpetuated online and exacerbating divisions and endangering peace and security. I, it is a country that I speak often about. The situation there is a situation that I speak often about. And I would say that last month, I, I also attended the Eradicate Hate Global Summit to commemorate the October 27th, 2018 shooting of 11 people, which was really the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in the history of the United States. So I went to the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, and um, we have to remember that the gunman had earlier posted anti-Semitic and anti-refugee hate messages online. So these tactics that are common to Holocaust and genocide in us and are often propagated online through his speech, they include disputing the number and identity of the Holocaust and genocide victims. So moving on uh, in terms of what we can do together, I, I would say that um, there are quite a number of examples of uh, where his speech has been mobilized online. Um, the, 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 what has happened to the Rohingya so much of it was mobilized online, and the, the evidence has been uh, given to uh, the, the to those who are looking into these issues. But in, in Myanmar, um, we saw the buildup of years of hatred and exclusionary rhetoric against the Rohingya, both online and offline. Um, and the fact-finding mission set up by the Human Rights Council has documented some of these instances. In Ethiopia, I've issued um, quite a number of statements and raised alarm especially in regard to hate speech. Um, I have pointed out inflammatory statements that have been used by leadership in Ethiopia, top political leaders and associated armed groups that have used dehumanizing, uh, dehumanizing language, like referring to other people as cancer, devil, weed, um, roots that need to be uprooted, weeds that need to be uprooted, birds, hyenas that need their tongues to be cut off, and um, they've been widely propagated online. And I th think we, we must remember that uh, before the genocide in, uh, against the Tutsi in Rwanda, that uh, they were dehumanized by being called cockroaches. So we also saw the similar dehumanization of the Jews before the Holocaust, they were called the uh, cancers. So I would just like to ask all of us in Gamak to keep a lookout for this kind of language, bring it to our attention uh, so that then we put together ways because we are working very closely with the um, social media tech and social media companies, we would be able to get into a position. We, we can do something about it in terms of getting the content offline, but also holding uh, people accountable. So in Iraq and Syria, I still also use social media platforms to spread their exclusionary ideology and hate speech. And uh, we know that social media contributes to find the flames of, flames of violence, but at the same time, uh, it brings people together important venue to connect people and we can continue to work with this. So um, I would like to say that uh, I encourage all of you here um, what we can do together as partners of GAMAC, that I encourage all of you here to look at the UN strategy and plan of action for hate speech and consider how it can be implemented through the work you're already doing on, on prevention. It's a very useful tool. It was um, written, drafted uh, with the um, uh, consultation with so many of you. I also encourage the Gamma community to strengthen ongoing efforts to fight online hate speech, um, even while we respect freedom of opinion and expression. And much needs to be done, especially in respect to content moderation. We know the algorithms that are used by tech and social media companies are not enough. Um, and um, because there are billions of messages posted daily in thousands of different languages and dialects. And I know um, that, um, I also believe that we solutions that will help us in solving 
problems um, need to be innovative. And GAMAC has uh, this big tent approach, uh, which offers a critical space to explore all these innovative ways to prevent and respond to the risk of atrocity crimes uh, effectively. I, I know you probably may have heard from your first panel that uh, there doesn't exist a universal uh, definition of what hate speech is. And um, I'm glad to say that um, the UN Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech gives a definition, um, defines hate speech as any kind of communication in speech, writing, or behavior that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or group on the basis of who they are, in other words, based on their religion, ethnicity, nationality, race, color, descent, gender, or other identity factor. And because there is always uh, this very thin line between freedom of expression and hate speech, um, we uh, again would en encourage um, in partnership with GAMAC leadership, including um, leaders of, of countries, of member states of the UN, um, to provide local ownership, national level ownership to tackle hate speech. Because we don't have an international legal definition of hate speech, and we rely quite a bit on uh, member states to um, provide um, uh, the, the the ways and, and, and means in which um, to ensure that hate speech is um, hate speech, especially um, people are brought to account for the things that they do um, on hate speech. So I would say the earlier the preventive action, the broader the range of options. And because hate speech is a risk factor for violence that must be addressed early as windows of opportunity close when crises is emerge. And addressing and countering hate speech requires the full commitment of all actors in society, locally, regionally, and internationally. And I am aware that Gamma can see developments from a perspective that we who now work in the United Nations uh, may miss. And so therefore, I look forward um, to your views. I look forward to the views of this panel on how to better utilize existing tools, um, but also how to create new tools and uh, also how to maximize uh, the, the convening power of this office um, for the cause of prevention of genocide in instances where and when hate speech constitutes a threat to peace and security. So as the UN focal point on hate speech, a special advice on the prevention of genocide, I do truly hope that we can advance the implementation of the UN strategy and plan of action on hate speech together in much the same way as uh, we consulted when drafting it. And I do hope so to keep learning from your rich experience and knowledge. And I can say um, that you can please count on my support in that of my office. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice, for, for this Im very important uh, uh, presentation. You have told us a lot of the good things that are happening in order to promote uh, more international cooperation and also more action at the national level. But you have also uh, uh, reminded us of how uh, hate speech can be a trigger of violence, can be a threat to security. You have given us examples from the past, but also from the present. And you have said something that leads us uh, immediately to, to our second panelist, because uh, you have talked about um, some, common, uh, some common denominators on the denial of facts, and you have brought us back to the Holocaust. And here we have Vishert uh, uh, and Have, a special advisor of IRA. And um, uh, IRA, uh, as, you, as you may know, the, the Alliance or the Holocaust, uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, they adopted on 10 October 2013, they adopted a working definition of Holocaust denial and distortion. Since then, IRA has developed and refined existing resources to allow for the identification of all the forms of denial and distortion of the Holocaust. They have very recently issued recommendations to identify uh, the, 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 uh, the, the distortion on, and counter the distortion of Holocaust. So, Vishard, can you provide us with an, an, a reflection on this denial and distortion of Holocaust and its connex, connection to hate speech as a trigger of atrocity prevention? Thank you for inviting me to this distinguished panel. Thank you, Sylvia, for your words and for your questions. Uh, it's always good to be at GAMAC uh, with their important work. Where do revisionism, hate speech, and distortion meet? 
when an individual person's responsibility for mass murder is changed into a heroic role for the nation, this is hate speech for the victims. When a nation's complicity in mass murder is revised as a heroic battle for independence, this is revisionism. It is a re distortion of the truth. For this reason, countering distortion is a challenge for all of us because it incites radicalism and radicalization and that can lead to violence. And so is Holocaust distortion. Holocaust distortion does not deny but mitigates and mischaracterizes the Holocaust, the persecution and murder of approximately 6 million Jews in the Second World War by the German Nazis and their allies. And it mitigates the genocides of the Roma. Holocaust distortion erodes our understanding of this history and nourishes conspiracy theories and dangerous forms of nationalism. It misuses the word Holocaust for other issues. It promotes instrumentalization by the state or individuals. Distortion is when the Holocaust is equated with other issues which are introduced as competing stories. The real history, depth and range of mass murder in the Holocaust is falsified this way. Distortion is not always easy to identify. Unlike denial, it uses partly real knowledge and then mitigates and mischaracterizes it. We have to look where the Holocaust is linked to other issues, to look where the truth of history is put in doubt and to be aware of new forms of nationalism and of those who despise this diversity in society. The special phenomenon in this time is the growing of nationalism and the actions for the rehabilitation of perpetrators in the Holocaust. These rehabilitations often hide the perpetratorship under a veil of patriotism. Ira, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, as has been said, has been an active player in the field of countering anti-Semitism and distortion. And indeed, already in 2013, a working definition was formulated and adopted. Last year, a global task force against Holocaust distortion was installed with help of the then German chair. In this year, 2021, several brochures and a film are published and made available online, some in cooperation with UNESCO and others. Titles are Understanding Holocaust Distortion and Recognizing and Countering Holocaust Distortion. This brochure contains recommendations for policy and decision makers and elaborates on, among others, identifying and monitoring Holocaust distortion, training to tackle distortion, strengthening institutions that address the safeguarding of the whole historical record, and recognizing and responding online. The toolkit for countering distortion will be ready for use in January next year. All these texts and tools are available on the website of the IRA holocaustremembrance.com, Holocaust Remembrance in one word. In the endeavor to counter Holocaust distortion, policymakers and government officials are essential partners. And as we heard, the UN is already a very important one. There is also a pressing need for media, social media, civil society partners, as well as law enforcement, to increase their awareness and strengthen their responses to this growing problem. It is a problem that reaches from Holocaust distortion to the undermining of democracy and to triggering mass atrocities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vishal, for, for telling us all the concrete things that are being done 
by IRA to, to counter the distortion and, and you, you have referred to, to very concrete initiatives to, to also to educate and to help to identify, as you said, distortion is not the same as denial. Sometimes it may be e not very easy to identify. You need tools for that. So, so thank you for, for this. And uh, uh, before uh, moving to, to the uh, next speakers, I would like to remind participants to send their questions via the chat function to uh, that uh, because this is an interactive exercise. So your questions are welcome your, uh, to, to the participants. So I would go to uh, Lieutenant General Romeo Daler. Uh, and um, uh, Romeo, if I may, uh, you yourself have uh, witnessed while in your post in, in Rwanda, uh, you, have, um, you have witnessed genocide and other mass atrocity crimes that they, they, and you have realized that these do not happen overnight. We have all learned that genocide is a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but you do have early signs. And how can, in your view, in your view how can the international community support and strengthen atrocity early warning mechanisms. And uh, also, may, if I may, a second question, um, and how can, what are the, can you provide current initiatives, good practices that uh, have supported national efforts towards, towards fighting hate speech and discrimination? You, as part of MIX, you uh, maybe, uh, you can tell us more about this, uh, can, can you build that from, from these uh, recommendations from last year's decoding hate speech uh, series that were um, uh, convened uh, by GAMAC and MIGS? So we are all ears, uh, Lieutenant Gen General. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm most appreciative of being able to communicate with you. I'm sitting in a hotel here in... Uh, in Switzerland, and I hope the communications are functioning. Uh, thank you to the GAMAC team for inviting me to this, and thank you through me inviting MIGS, the Montreal Institute of Genocide and Human Rights Studies, as a innovative institution that is working uh, with hate speech in a way of neutralizing it in one fashion or another, and I'll attempt to answer your questions in the short time left uh, for me. I, I wish I to, to, to say particularly thank you to seeing Madame Alice there, uh, who has worked with us the, in different um, uh, endeavors in the past, and we are very proud of her and of the, the office that has been created and her being now uh, holding that office and doing it with such dynamics. I wish, however, to just mention one thing is that when uh, in your speech, Shai Badam, you mentioned how uh, the UN failed in the genocide to pick it up. I, I would say that uh, I made terrible mistakes, I'm sure, on the ground during previous and during the genocide. I think the Secretariat also made mistakes we were in, in trying to come to grips with it, let alone uh, stop it because we certainly didn't prevent it, that's for sure. Uh, but I truly believe uh, that uh, the essence of why the failure happened was in the hands of every sovereign state of the world that had any capability of being able uh, to intervene, uh, whether politically, uh, whether economically, whether by resources, military, or whatever, they refused to assist us. And I think that blood on the hands of the world cannot be minimized and should not be minimized. And I think fighting hate speech might help, might help slightly erase some of the blood of uh, those who are suffering from mass atrocities today. We all are guilty. And so do not underestimate, in my opinion, uh, the impact that it has had uh, on states, but in particular, how states should be using that as a catalyst for being far more progressive in reinforcing the UN's effort and through the UN uh, building a capacity. So with that said, 
we've seen how hate speech has in fact in recent times uh, you know, hit countries like uh, Myanmar and Sri Lanka and Ethiopia. And uh, it is uh, not unusual that I'm seeing still revisionism and even hate speech regard surrounding uh, the uh, Rwandan uh, genocide of Tutsis and, and how distortion of information can, particularly through the written media, uh, have uh, brought, in fact, a very negative perspective to the ultimate resolution of reconciliation and, and lasting peace. So it's there and it's alive. Now, uh, my experience of the Rwandan genocide was watching a very, and listening to a very crude method of, um, of expanding uh, the hate of one ethnic group against another uh, and inciting young people. And there's the key, inciting the young people, the people 18 and under, the people who are used as the child soldiers, who are used as the perpetrators, inciting them uh, to ultimately uh, conduct uh, mass atrocities uh, and genocide. And so Radio Milkalin, a very, very basic radio capability, which ultimately was held accountable for as the genocide radio, uh, held accountable for sustaining the genocide, not only inciting the genocide, but sustaining it through its rather sophisticated ways of inciting young people uh, into hatred that ultimately led them into an indoctrination to kill, an indoctrination to despise, to ultimately want to eliminate, as Madam Alice said, the cockroaches uh, that are in their country. And so it is that tool to be able to ingrain in the minds of the youth and by that doing so launch an extraordinarily horrible power base to take action because so many of the demographics of the country, uh, countries of the world today have sometimes up to 50% of their population, 15 and under, who listen and are now becoming more engaged. Why is that? They're becoming more engaged because they are starting to master the social communications revolution that's going on. And because they can do that, that means you can incite in real time and, and sustain it uh, worldwide, globally, without borders, hate. And that tool is the force multiplier of hate into the world, as much as it could be such an extraordinary instrument as it is at times to in fact bring humanity together and launch us in a synergy together uh, to move humanity to the next level of human rights and of respect for each other. It is and has been turned in its immature, immaturity, sophisticated system, but immature, how that system in the hands of youth have in fact been a horrific incitement capability of creating not only hate, but ultimately leading people to move from hate to action and ultimately mass atrocities and genocide. And so I am very much involved with my colleagues at MIGS at the Montreal Institute, which is a close friend of Guy Mack, and we intend to remain close to you and hope to be to be a, a progressive instrument uh, of uh, GAMEC, and at the same time, uh, get closer to you also, Madam Alice, as you have been with us in order to be, and I'm gonna be a soldier here, be a weapon of positive peace, positive serenity, and of ultimately being able to neutralize, neutralize uh, hate speech. And so we created, uh, the Digital Mass Atrocity Prevention Lab. And it's sort of like a hub that's working against hate speech to combat genocidal ideologies and to work as a counterforce against extremism and their ideas. This lab is a action-oriented progressive tool that is working within the digital world because that's where, that's where the force multiplying capability exists. 
Now it's interesting that Marshall McLuhan and Canadians are not usually out there bragging about their people, but he was a very famous Canadian philosopher on communications theory. And he once remarked, all wars have been fought by the latest technology available in any culture. It should come, however, then as no surprise that the social media platforms have become the weapons of war of the 21st century. They are the instruments that can destroy, not, not just influence, destroy. And that's the, the theme, that's the, the strength, that's the depth that we must be bringing to this debate is that these are action verbs action verbs because those words are action verbs. And so although this military terminology may offend some, I fear that unless you move it to a plateau of being able to move from some of the arcane classic methods of meeting a brand new weapon system that's been deployed out there and moving away in order to prove in fact that we can, we can attack and we can neutralize, we can subside the impact of the digital world, the digital communications revolutions by in fact, looking at a more progressive instrument of engagement of the youth in this realm. They are not always gonna be youth. There will always be youth, but they are not themselves gonna remain youth they will move into adulthood. What they're picking up now in this revolution of communications is going to stay with them. And so I would argue that the weaponization of the social media where revolutionary technological times uh, because of its impact and in the hands of populations that has no limits and has no optic of its full potential can in bad faith use this as a significant influence in real time to affect uh, people to consolidate, to coalesce, and to build momentum into action. And so just as I worked as the patron of the Pugwash movement, the Pugwash movement to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons and to create arms control, and we still exist. And we did, yeah, get a Nobel Peace Prize and it's pan global, but there are still, still tens of thousands of nuclear weapons there. And there is still the foolishness of states that think that that's this horrific arcane weapon system is actually gonna stabilize the world and give us peace. They are the most useless instrument. And in fact, I consider them an insult and a threat to my human right to security. Well, as we work at building that movement, and continue to work at countries to a trit, reduce that weapon system, I believe we've got to focus on the youth now with their new system, their global system of the digitization of communications. And with that new generation, which I call the generation without borders, the under 25s, let's say, they work globally already. They should be the front lines of changing the attitudes in regards to the use of that system. And in fact, they themselves participate in reducing the capability of hate speech uh, on, in fact, uh, the social medias that are out there. I'm not saying let's create a digital peace corps or something like that, however, or even digital peacekeepers, but I am saying that we do need a movement, a movement of youth committed and dedicated to reinforcing the strength of the digital communication revolution among youth to then take on hate speech, them to demonstrate how they consider it to be so offensive as to be inappropriate to even make its way onto the international sphere. And so, I think that, yeah, I'm absolutely for, as I conclude, the governments to play a role in streamlining polis, policies and engaging experts uh, with knowledge in social media and atrocity prevention, of course. I mean, that's their job. 
and they better be doing it. And in fact, be involved in it, but in a far more aggressive way than I've seen so far. Second, I think, yeah, innovative civil society organizations to deal with this issue, of course. And I think that they can both government but private sector get online and engage and support online innovators in order to attenuate the impact of hate speech. I think the prevention methods of sort of the extremist cheerleaders and their supporters can be tracked and can be cracked. We can break that code. I am convinced we can, but not maybe with people of my age, but I think by the youth who will ultimately suffer because we're gonna enter into an era of generational wars, generational conflicts and the sustainment of hate. How can deployed ultimately to establish uh, a humanitarian protection zone uh, in the Southwest of Rwanda, how could legionnaires coming from a Franco country, 18 years old, tell me to my face that he hated Tutsis? How, where did that come from? And how could it in fact still be part of a philosophy or thinking of a force that has an ethos, that has the discipline, that is supposed to have the neutrality of meeting the, its nation's needs, and particularly in a, in a humanitarian role. And so, yeah, the platforms are out there and they're gonna to continue to be sophisticated. And Google's gonna be out there and Google, hey, who says that Google's replacement could not go rogue? Who's putting the control on it? What is the instrument that's gonna make sure that they don't digitize things that are not complete, but in fact, that are skewed. How can we prevent them from going rogue? And so ultimately, the big users, the ones who are in the forefront of this era of revolution of communications, the ones who are already global, and the ones who have got the most to lose into the future because it's their future, they're the ones who are gonna face this and they're the ones often who are called to try to stop it. The youth of the world, that generation of the borders, they have to be engaged in an attrition battle to fight this horrific instrument being uh, through this horrific instrument called hate speech to be in fact neutralized on the waves and ultimately turn the social media into the most progressive piece of, of humanity and peace that we've ever seen so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your remarks. And uh, Susan, uh, the, uh, 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 Romeo Daler has just uh, told us that uh, he is convinced, and I'm glad that he has this positive attitude, that, uh, that we can attack, neutralize, the impact of, uh, of digital technologies in the dissemination of hate speech. Now, Susan, your organization, one of the pillars of your organization is to track and study dangerous speech. Now, can you provide us with examples of your, or, or, or your advising services to technology companies to mitigate and respond to harmful discourse? Yes, first of all, um, thanks so much for the opportunity to participate. I'll have to be extremely brief as the, the panel has uh, um, so far gone a bit longer than <laughs> planned. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, social media companies to try to um, uh, diminish either what we call dangerous speech, which is any form of communication that can inspire uh, people to condone or commit violence against another group of people. Um, uh, we, we try to help them to, uh, to diminish either uh, that speech or its effects. And it's very crucial, of course, to keep in mind the importance of both um, simply attempting to delete all of the inflammatory hate speech or dangerous speech will never work. It's uh, what some people have called a game of, of whack-a-mole you know, uh, it will keep on reappearing faster than it can be deleted. Um, as uh, Lieutenant General Dallaire has, uh, has pointed out, the real solution is to um, educate people to 
understand this kind of communication, to see it as the as as the uh, political tool that it is, as the tool of manipulation and war that it is, um, and to be able to resist it. Um, my my organization, my which is a research team, um, also works to try to to conduct research and experiments to better understand how we can in fact diminish the impact of such um, of such speech of such communication. Um, it isn't, after all, effective if you're trying to conquer any major human problem, whether it's uh, the widespread prevalence of of, of smoking or a disease, um, uh, particularly if you're speaking about one related to human behavior, it isn't effective simply to, uh, to attempt solutions randomly, as, as some people have called it, to throw spaghetti at the wall. It's much more effective to try interventions and then to rigorously measure their impact to find out what is in fact most effective. Just to give you an example, there are some horrifying warnings on cigarette packages in some countries, but research has, you know, showing um, uh, the terrible effects of smoking and trying to remind smokers that they can literally be killed by smoking. However, research indicates that those warnings don't in fact diminish um, smoking. So they look convincing perhaps to non-smokers, but they aren't actually very effective. So I just want to remind um, this uh, distinguished panel and our audience of the enormous importance of rigorously studying interventions and their, and their, their effects. Then I wanna make uh, just a few quick points. Um, one is that as, as Alas Naritu has pointed out, uh, the UN has proposed uh, a definition of, of hate speech. Um, it isn't the same thing as uh, language or other forms of communication that can inspire atrocities. It's important to remember that in that, that, that definition refers to communication that refers in some pejorative manner to another identity group. Pejorative sets an extremely low bar. You can say any number of things about another group of people that, that could be understood as pejorative, but that do not at all increase the risk of atrocities. So I would remind Gamak of, of the great importance of uh, focusing on the forms of speech that, that do seem likely to increase the risk of atrocities. Uh, this is also enormously important for protecting freedom of expression. Then I wanna make a, a, a second point, which is that as, as uh, Lieutenant General Dallaire has pointed out critically, states often fail to prevent, uh, to react, to prevent and stop mass atrocities. There's another very uh, important point to me made regarding states, however, and it's often missed at uh, uh, gatherings like this and discussions like this. That is that inflammatory hate speech, or what I call dangerous speech, the kind that inspires the youth, young people to commit mass atrocities. Most of that comes from states. States produce it. Ethiopia is a, is a horrifying and striking example at the moment of um, dangerously inflammatory speech coming directly from states from state officials, and also from many people uh, uh, whom the state is condoning, the state is encouraging uh, to repeat such communication. We also have uh, many other cases in which major political leaders or heads of state do not themselves um, produce or circulate such speech. However, states often endorse it or even covertly finance it. There are uh, many examples of state-sponsored troll armies operating online um, to tremendous effect. Uh, this is a, a, a widespread sub-phenomenon um, and a, a, a tremendously important consequence of social media that, that again, Lieutenant General uh, Dallaire has reminded us of the great importance of, and, and Alice as well, of the enormous importance of social media. Uh, it's worth noticing exactly which are uh, the, the phenomena 
that social media engenders, since after all, social media is a mechanism, is a means for humans to spread uh, all kinds of content, good and bad. Um, the uh, government use of social media to spread uh, a content that inspires violence is unfortunately um, very widespread. And uh, it would be a mistake not to try to do something about that if uh, we are serious about um, diminishing the terrible uh, impact of human communication that inspires atrocities. Um, you know, we can't really speak about the responsibility to protect without speaking about the responsibility not to um, uh, not to uh, touch off or inspire or direct violence in the first place. And when I say violence, of course, I'm referring now to mass atrocities. Uh, I have two more quick points to make. One is that, um, of course, uh, most dangerous speech, as I call it, is also false. So there is an enormous overlap between dangerous speech or inflammatory hate speech, I'm using those terms interchangeably, and disinformation, which is, of course, a topic of great concern at the moment. Uh, the social media platforms have become quite interested, especially in the context of COVID-19, in what they might do to uh, remove and or to uh, counteract disinformation. They also have paid some attention to hate speech. Uh, it's very important also to get them and, and, and to get ourselves to focus on the overlap between these two categories. Inflammatory speech, which is also false and to ask uh, to, to rigorously investigate which are the ways of most effectively proceeding against that. There's quite a substantial body of research, for example, on how to um, uh, convince people that a particular assertion is false. Um, unfortunately, simply telling them and presenting, even presenting evidence, is often ineffective and sometimes even reinforces their belief in the falsehood. Um, however, uh, of course, I don't have time to, uh, to summarize research, but uh, uh, research and evidence are again, enormously useful for efforts to counter uh, dangerous speech and disinformation and, and, and particularly to work on the overlap, which I again suggest is vital. Um, and then one final remark, about how um, dangerous disinformation, how dangerous speech really circulates online. It is generally produced by people um, who are unfortunately devoted to doing that, who think it's very important and want to do it and, and are unlikely to be convinced to stop. However, uh, it circulates very widely. Why? because huge numbers of people forward and share and recirculate dangerous content. And here's the point that I want to make. It's about intent. Most of those people who, who share and forward and proliferate dangerous content uh, don't think they're doing something harmful, don't recognize that content as dangerous and usually also don't recognize it as false, they often think that they are doing something to protect their friends and family. This was the case in Rwanda. This is the case regarding COVID-19. So it's important when we think about uh, effective interventions to distinguish between the people who are doing this um, with malicious intent and the people who spread such content on the contrary, thinking that they are doing something helpful. Um, uh, for lack of time, I'll, I'll stop there. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to contribute. I hope it has been useful. And I'm also very grateful for all the remarks of the other panelists. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. And uh, you bring us back uh, with some of the things, very important things that you have said. You bring us back to, to, to something uh, that it is key, which is uh, on one is 
the need to strike a right balance between uh, hate speech and, and, and freedom of expression. And then you said, well, you need, uh, as GAMAC and in the international community in general, you need to really focus on the type of hate speech that can indeed trigger violence and not to establish a very low bar. And, uh, and also you just mentioned something about intent, uh, that some of the, uh, the people disseminating uh, what could be considered hate speech do not necessarily do with a malicious uh, intent. And that brings us to some of the questions we have been receiving from the audience. And I have one, uh, may maybe Susan, you want to say something because we also I, have I, related yes, I'd just to like to yeah. clarify, perhaps I didn't speak clearly enough. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do think it's enormously important to protect freedom of expression. And I do, as I do think, as I said, that the, that the UN definition sets a very low bar for the definition of hate speech. It defines it extremely broadly. Um, but I was trying to make two different points. One is that if your purpose is to prevent mass atrocities, which I understand uh, GAMAX to be, then you should focus not on all hate speech as uh, very broadly defined by the UN definition, but on the subset of hate speech that is related to mass atrocities. It may be that someone else wants to proceed against hate speech that uh, doesn't have anything to do with mass atrocities and isn't likely to inspire them. Um, but then that's a different enterprise. Does that make sense? Very much sense, and it's exactly what I understood you okay. had said. So thank you, don't worry. Wonderful. Of course, the question is always, uh, when is exactly the point when something can trigger violence and when do you need to start by uh, by worrying? But that is another question and is not an easy one. But this indeed relates us to um, when is there a danger? And that, if, if I may, brings us uh, maybe one of the questions, additional question to, to Vichert. Um, because uh, the, one of the questions that we have been receiving from the audience to, to you in particular, Vichert, is if you can elaborate more on the danger of distortion. Hmm? Uh, it, and, uh, and actually, I would also say, is distortion of Holocaust always uh, also uh, done with a malicious intent? Also, are we seeing examples of distortion that may be maybe even done because of ignorance? Uh, but I, one of the questions is indeed to elaborate more on the dangers of, of distortion. Uh, Vishard, you are muted, please. If you can unmute. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the danger of distortion, as I try to 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 uh, eliminate, is uh, the fact that uh, uh, it's in a sense. I try, I try to be very concise and short and short. In, in a sense, it, it, it tries to uh, incite to radicalism. Um, uh, that is what I uh, try, we will, will try to, to convince Susan of that this general radicalization leads often to more uh, radical utterances and at the end to incitement. And that is clearly what we have seen in the prehistory of the Holocaust, that simple ideological uh, impregnation of a cert certain ideas can in the long run make people to do things uh, they never dreamt of before. And that is in the end the, 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 the danger of distortion. And then the second question was, of course, uh, the, 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 there are different opinions about a lot of things in international politics and in politics at home. And uh, of course, people can reproach themselves that they are distort distorting reality. This is, this is, of course, not what I meant. It is a, a real contradiction of what has been common knowledge about, and in this case, the Holocaust, but it could, could be in many other cases, as where uh, General Dallaire spoke about the distortion of what is accepted as the, the, the uh, reality that is uh, 
has been argumentated by research and evidence. There is a difference, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and this uh, indeed gives us, bring us also to what was uh, being said by, by, by Romeo Dallaire, uh, because you mentioned, uh, Romeo, the, you mentioned in particular the dangers of inciting the young people to conduct uh, mass atrocities. And, um, uh, and maybe in this, and we're talking here about hate speech that is really targeted at inciting. And, uh, but uh, can you tell us more about the, um, your foundation's activities that are targeted to educating young people to be more tolerant and resilient? Can you give us a little bit more uh, examples on, on this type of activities? That is, in fact, the uh, object of the work that we're trying to achieve right now uh, with uh, some of the um, interesting world of artificial intelligence uh, and trying to uh, see how we can uh, get into the what we call a do loop or the decision loop that youth uh, take when they are actually on the system seeking information, looking for information and finding stuff sometimes uh, unexpectedly, other times uh, deliberately. How do we get into the loop of their decision making? And some of the work that we're doing through uh, some of the uh, artificial intelligence organizations that are working here, in, particularly in the Montreal area, uh, are looking at specifically that. Are there uh, instruments that can be brought to the attention of the youth that will, in fact, be triggered by? Uh, the uh, creation of hate speech or uh, terminologies or, or in fact sites that will do that. So I, I uh, would love to be able to provide the information that we have uh, to in fact uh, GAMAC as you've, <laughs> we've done before because we've worked together already, uh, but like to spread it to uh, the community that is participating today. But there is no way that our current tools are actually able to be proactive unless we use some, in fact, counter new technology. And that's what I think that we're going to be looking at. Uh, and if that can work, that will be, uh, and that sometimes may surprise us, that will be something that they will grasp on faster than our classic methodologies of of education and information and so on from, from elders. It is far more peer structured. And that's, I believe, uh, the answer for the future. And I'm hopefully not too evasive. However, we are keen uh, to spread the information that we have and we'll love to use the platform to do that. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for these final words. Uh, we are uh, running a bit late now, so I will need to immediately uh, uh, turn to, uh, to, to Claire, uh, unless uh, you want to add, uh, you have one second to add something that if you, <laughs> if you wish so, if not, I will uh, continue with, with Claire. Claire, back to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone, the speakers and the audience for joining us on this first day of GAMAC 4 for your insightful comments and questions. Do check out the Innovation Square. You'll find the menu underneath the workshops menu on your screen. The Innovation Square is a virtual exhibition of organizations showcasing their innovative approaches and projects. You can discover and explore the exhibition at your own pace and time and connect and engage the organizations and other conference participants. Tomorrow, we'll start at 6 a.m. in the Americas, midday in Europe and Africa, and at 1900 in Asia Pacific. We'll start off with two workshops. The first is organized by Parliamentarians for Global Action and looks at women legislators against racism, hate speech, and discrimination. It's followed at one o'clock European time with a workshop on masculinities and atrocity crimes, and that's organized by the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs. If you've not registered yet for a workshop, we encourage you to do so as the places are limited. 
It's a very unique opportunity for you to hear directly from experts and practitioners and to participate in these important interactive conversations. After that, Sylvia will be moderating two discussions on addressing hate speech and preventing discrimination, firstly in the European context and then in the global context. So that's all from me and Sylvia. We look forward to seeing you then.